So I hope everyone voted. Um, we're going to talk a lot today. We have uh, a couple of really important and good guests. Uh, to my, we'll start with the person to my right. Matt Herbel is professor of political science here at Villanova, specializing in American government with a particular interest in political communication, the presidency, and American elections. He's the author, co-author, or editor of eight books, including Metroids, Online Progressives, and the Transformation of American Politics. And if it bleeds, it leads, and an anatomy of television news. His latest book on the history and development of American political parties called Party On was co-authored with John Kenneth White and will be published by Oxford University Press this spring. Uh, to his left and my immediate right is John Zabi, uh, who I've known since childhood. Well, maybe I was a child. <laughs> 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 He's a, a veteran bolster, um, president, uh, president uh, was president of John Zagreb International, and his current president, or your son is current, the firm. You're over three so far, so we'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to tell you what he told me about it. Check the website, there. okay? Then. <laughs> Best song author of uh, The Way Will Be. And John has many ties to Roman University. How many people uh, of your cousins have gone here uh, at one point or another? Nine. Nine. I was just counting, yeah. So he's paid for a lot of our salaries. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to introduce in a few minutes uh, two other uh, professors uh, and uh, a very esteemed news fan from the Philadelphia. But uh, Matt and John, let's talk about politics. Okay, thanks, Mark. And we're, uh, we're going to have a little discussion first about polling, and then I'm going to uh, talk to John a little bit about his sense of how this political cycle is shaping up. So um, I thought actually we could start with something that's a mystery for a lot of people, which is how can a how can pollster speak to a few hundred people and draw conclusions that apply to potentially millions of people? Very simple principle. Can you hear me okay? Let's say there's a jar of marbles here. There's 10 million marbles in the jar. Some are black and some are white. Uh, how many are black and how many are white? I could spend the rest, well, you guys could spend the rest of your lives counting every single marble and hoping you don't get interrupted in the, in the meantime. And you get an exact count, sort of. Or what we can do by simple law of probability is draw a certain number out and take that draw, let's say that we draw a thousand marbles out, get determined that a certain percentage are black and a certain percentage are white and understand that if that's random and if we do that 100 times in 95 out of those 100 times, we'll get the same percentage plus or minus three points on either side. Um, not only because I've made a career out of it, I opt for the draw of a thousand because uh, I think it's a lot easier. And so essentially, even though we're dealing with people when we're polling and there are many variables involved when you're dealing with people, it's pretty much the same principle that if the poll is done correctly, meaning following to the degree that it's possible, the, the laws of random uh, probability sampling, the same sort of thing, a 95% confidence rate that we'll get the same percentages of responses, plus or minus, whatever the sample size is. What happens if you can only reach some of those marbles on a cell phone? Because uh, one of the things that pollsters have had to deal with recently is people who don't have landlines. And without landlines, traditional polling methods uh, could miss those people. So how do, how, do, how do you deal with that? Long answer, warning. Long answer Long coming answer. in. Um, first of all, now that I've stated the position about the laws of probability, let's understand that the era of random probability sampling is pretty much over. So what we can do is aim for as close to random probability sampling as, as we can get. Secondly, times have changed 
dramatically. When I started in this business in 1984, every three people we reached on the phone, landline, because the U.S. had 95% landline penetration. Uh, every three people we reached on the phone, two gladly took the survey. 1984, shh, I have a long distance call. Somebody's calling and asking me questions. This is important. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, we now have a typical national survey at the height of a presidential race. 22 to 24% response rate. Eight or 9% response rates in major metropolitan areas. We have all sorts of technology that weeds out people. We have a culture that has been transformed as far as the telephone. And now, directly to your answer, landline penetration rates today are what they were in 1963, 63% of households. And that number is actually going down. So we've had to make an adjustment in the rules of engagement. The first and obvious adjustment is that figuring that uh, what was 16% cell phone penetration in 2008 is now 34% cell phone penetration in 2011, 2012. We do two separate samples. We call landlines and we call cell phones and then merge the samples, aiming for as close to the 34% response you know, from cell phones as we can get of our, of our total sample. But that's not the only problem that we've had to change the rules of engagement. The other problem is, I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but a typical poll is 40, 60, 70, 80 questions. It's not, hello, who are you going to vote for? How old are you? Goodbye. It doesn't work like that. There is a real problem trying to tie someone up on a cell phone for 40, 60, or 80 questions. That's why we've had to pioneer in some new methods, which I'll be happy to talk about. Well, I imagine that some of that involves the internet. Yeah. And I know that you do internet polling. Uh, I also know internet polling can be controversial. There are systematic differences between groups of people that have access to the internet and groups that don't have access to the internet. So uh, maybe you could say a little bit about that, about why you've chosen to do polling on the internet, and how do you address critics who say this just isn't reliable? First of all, let's understand that in every aspect of our lives, whether it's the university, the news media, politics, whatever, all of the old rules are becoming obsolete daily. There are, we are standing on tectonic plates. Same with the polling industry. And so, as with everything else, standing on those te tectonic plates, we're adjusting to changes that are constantly happening. happening. So, for us, we started in 1999 collecting an internet panel. We did it the hard way. There were no sweepstakes. There were no uh, giveaways and trips. Uh, there were no paid incentives. We used our call center and every time we did a survey, a national one, regional one, state, whatever, we asked a simple question at the end. Would you like to be part of an internet panel? Can we have your email address? And then we called back and validated, and validated the demographics. And then we used banner ads, we used referrals, we used uh, purchases of millions of email addresses and f floated those through multiple serv servers simultaneously, inviting people. Anyway, 500,000 on our panel. And then we would use our call center to validate those uh, and verify those email addresses and, and demographics. The principle that we introduced then was verification and validation, number one. Number two, 
the reintroduction of the principle of random probability sampling. When we were doing a national survey, we would draw a random sampling of our panel. So if we had, during a national survey of 1,000, we would draw um, a random sampling of about seven or 8,000 email addresses, invite people to a secure website to take the survey. They could take it once. It couldn't be gamed. Uh, you know, every once in a while I would read in blogs, um, oh, all of us here at Johnson Dormitory at the University of Michigan took a Zogby survey and we load, it can't, it can't be done. So we were contacted by the Wall Street Journal in 2004. We would like, they said, to do all 50 states and feature a full page map of Zogby polls every two weeks. Great, I'm in. That was 2004. We weren't quite ready, but we were game for this on one hand. On the other hand, they said, we don't have very much money. <laughs> so we did it. Anyway, uh, what we discovered was that nationally, our panel was perfect. In fact, it was slightly more accurate than our telephone sample which missed the national election by 0.6. In all 50 states, the larger mid-sized states were very good. Smaller states, we did not have enough of a penetration or representation of some of those states that so we blew a few. Did, did, you, did you sense that as you were going along? Sure. You look at the numbers and you say, this just doesn't seem right to me? Yes. Yeah, but you published them. But I published them because um, I thought, we're experimenting. And let's throw it out there. Let's make this an act of courage. <laughs> Don't be courageous. <laughs> Go with the flow. No, you know, we, we, we did that. So. Anyway, the, there, are, there are critics, uh, there are controversies about internet polling. Let me say it's about 88% there. It's not 100%. At the same time, it's 88% there. I'm seeing the traditional telephone poll heading backwards. So we're sort of betwixt and between. We'll stick with the internet polling simply because, um, let me say this. It's the wave of the future. It needs to be developed. We are predictably in uh, the emerging world outside of the United States bypassing the telephone and going from face-to-face -face interviews right to internet interviews. Why? Because the tectonic plates exist everywhere. When corporations call us, when NGOs call us, when political candidates call us in Tunis or Cairo or Albania, and they say, we need results, we don't want to know results over six weeks. We want to know results now. And you just simply can't field that kind of a face-to-face -face survey. Okay. Um, that was a long answer. But, but you know, it was, a, it, was, it was a question that I think required a long answer mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's not uh, easy or obvious. Let, let, me, let me give you a question that maybe requires a short answer. How can you tell if a poll is any good, you know, one of the characteristics of uh, the current political and media environment is that we are overwhelmed with numbers. There are so many polls out there, polls for candidates, polls for broadcast outlets, polls for newspapers, partisan polls, nonpartisan polls, just a lot of data, a lot of numbers. How do you make your way through that? Or what advice would you give to people who uh, may not have an experience or a background in polling, how can they figure out uh, if a poll is, is, is reliable, if it makes sense, or if it should just be discarded? Well, look for the big Z. 
Okay, that's... Okay. that's <laughs> are, are, are we done? I, I think we're yeah, done. Okay. I think that's, I think that's it. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, the <laughs> just last week, I had a piece in Forbes, this very thing. CNN did a poll in which they had Obama leading by nine. And Gallup, at that same point in time, had Romney leading by six. So I deconstructed the polls. And what I discovered is that the CNN poll had 47% of the sample as Democrat, and 38% of the poll was Republican. That translates into nine points plus Democrat, hence a nine-point lead for Obama. It was wrong. Um, by the same token, Gallup, Gallup is very good. And CNN and opinion research are very good. But Gallup's problem is when it does daily tracking, what happens is you know, you, you take a, a sample of 400 each day. So let's say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You, you sample 400 each day. You have a sample then of 1,200, you get a result. And then Thursday you do a new 400 and you eliminate Monday. So it's a rolling average of 1,200. And when you're calling nationally 400 people in one day, you, you know, remember I said there's a 95% confidence rate well, when you're polling every single day and you're only doing 400, you can have one of those 5% days, you know? I know, I majored in it. Um, you, you just can. And your job is then to stick with the number. Uh, Gallup, uh, in its instance, had an oversampling of Republicans the one day. And so one of the things that I pioneered in was, you know, I know you're going to ask this uh, anyway, but when we do our polls and they replicate the, uh, the nation or the state or whatever, no matter how good the raw sample comes in, we have to make adjustments. We always get an underrepresentation of African Americans. We always get an underrepresentation of Latinos. We always get an underrepresentation of young people. That's just the way it is. Uh, and we also always get an underrepresentation of Christian conservatives. In that sense, we all have to apply some weights and adjustments. And one of the things that I have done over the years is I have utilized um, weights for party identification. Uh, meaning that, generally speaking, overall, you tend to have a slightly higher proportion of Dems than a national sample will yield, and a slightly lower portion of Republicans. And so I've sought to, you know, keep, uh, it's what we call a turnout model. What's a typical turnout look like? Generally, about 39% Democrat, 35, 36% Republican. If my sample comes in, um, and it has too many Democrats, too few Republicans, I'll apply a little bit of, a, of an adjustment there. So, so you treat party identification as a constant in that sense. The argument for not doing that would be to treat party ID as a variable and to say that people will, uh, people will report their partisanship uh, as a reflection of what they're thinking. So that if you have a sample that has, say, more Republicans than you might expect to find in your turnout model, uh, that could be telling you that people are leaning towards 
the Republican Party, and so they're expressing that through their self-identification. So how would you how would you address that? And not not every pollster waits the same way. Not every pollster no. waits for party ID. So how would you address that uh, that perspective that perhaps party identification is uh, has more of a variable quality uh, than than you have in your turnout model? Because um, the problem is, I never get a wide variation in party identification. I mean, there, there, there are some instances, you know, great colleagues, um, I'm sure they feel the same way, uh, Pew and Gallup and so on. Some days I'll see a wild poll and I'll see, honestly, 43% Democrat, 23% Republican. Come on, that's just not America. That is an unpublishable poll. I never have raw data that ever comes in with that wide a differential. And so normally when I'm talking about a party weight, I'm only talking about a couple of points here and a couple of points there. And God, if no one else will say it, I'm usually pretty good, huh? Yeah, yeah, okay. At that, at that point, Sorry. No, no, what's, what's interesting is at, at that point, uh, polling becomes to a degree as much art as it is science. Abs absolutely. Ab four words, absolutely. That's four words? It's, yeah, it's, uh, four words. It, it's like contraception. We're going to get into that one in a second. Well, we, we, we probably will. Yeah, that comes under the, are there any other issues in this campaign besides the economy? Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll get to okay. that a little later. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, actually, I'd like, to, I'd like to turn our attention to the, uh, to the political cycle in a second. I just, just before we leave the discussion about polling, uh, I'm, I'm a little curious about uh, your perspective on polling and news narratives because, uh, let's get back to the Gallup poll, for instance. When the Gallup poll, uh, mm -hmm. the tracking poll that came out, showed Romney with a, uh, a lead over Obama in their initial uh, report, that shaped the news narrative of the campaign for a few days uh, because it was interesting, it was different, and that obviously appealed to political reporters They wanted to talk about that. Now, over, over the last couple of days, that Gallup poll has done exactly what you said it was going to do, uh, that oversample uh, eventually dropped out of the poll, and uh, the numbers regressed to the mean. So uh, in that regard, the news narrative that was shaped by the initial publication of the poll uh, was really talking about an artifact. So I'm curious about your sense of how reporters use your polls, others' polls, and if you could say anything in general about the relationship between polling and, and news narratives. Well, you know, the problem with the instant media, uh, the pervasive instantaneous media, uh, another tectonic shift in our lives, a lot of adjustments in, in the newsroom, but it's the lack of perspective. It's, if it's a crisis at noon, it's a global crisis of immense proportions if it hasn't been resolved by 4.30. And that's troubling. It, what's equally troubling is when you use the poll of the day to drive the news of the day. I'll tell you a prominent example, and this is kind of like ancient history, but in the 1996 election, <clears throat> Clinton versus Dole, some of you may recall that I always had it as a much closer race. Um, my colleagues at CBS New York Times, ABC Washington Post, Gallup, Clinton leading by 21 points, 18 <coughs> points. Mine would be 9 or 10, sometimes 12 or 13. Um, some days there'd be a fluctuation. But generally, we were, we were really very different. But what troubled me, and, and this is not partisan in, in any way, because I'm personally my, my pedigree is very liberal Democrat, but I try not to show it when, I, when I'm working professionally. But Bob Dole, I'd be, I'd be polling Ohio for Reuters, and I'd have Dole down by seven in Ohio. And I would watch Sam Donaldson reporting on Dole as like the fourth story 
on ABC News and, and saying, Bob Dole campaigned in Columbus, a state where he's a behind by as much as 25 points. I was thinking, nobody deserves that. You know, you use a wrong poll, you get lousy coverage. And then, of course, that feeds on itself. It feeds on itself, absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be self-fulfilling, yeah. sure. Since we're talking about it, one of, one of my pet peeves is when reporters will take a one-point change in an opinion poll and talk about it as if it's a meaningful or significant change when it's just as likely to be random. You so, gotta make news. You gotta make news, gotta yeah. Make news. And as you said, the, the news cycle now is perpetual. Yeah, I, I got trapped in, in that in, in 2008. Um, you know, when you're doing daily tracking, it can be like watching paint dry, you know? And like you're coming out with a daily news release and you know, you can't say, there was absolutely nothing interesting today. <laughs> Although, you know, on most days, there is, there is absolutely news. nothing there interesting. Nothing interesting. Because, because public opinion is relatively stable. And there are periods of time in a campaign where yeah. we see shifts, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's fairly stable. So sure, and reporters what you, what are you stuck say? watching the this, uh, this, this same, you know, political stump speech day in and day out. Um, but... You know, what happened the f Friday before the election, uh, Obama-McCain, was that um, in the three-day rolling average, the Friday sample had McCain leading by one. And so I thought very responsibly, you know, Obama maintains lead at seven points. Um, but you know, we would write the body of the news release and then in italics below pollster John Zogby, uh, I suggested that you know, McCain was leading this one single day. Is there a trend to watch? I'll tell you why I did that in a second. But three hours later, shock poll on Drudge. Zogby has McCain leading. Those are not pleasant. Mo those are not pleasant moments. And it didn't end there. No. That's, it, it set off a firestorm in the blogosphere. I know. Yeah, that's I right. I was the bloggy. Yeah, yeah. you're the bloggy. Um, that was like, actually the day before, I gave a, a breakfast talk in um, Rochester. And somebody said to me, um, What's the scenario for Obama to win? What's the scenario for McCain to win? Um, and so I gave each of the scenarios, flew to Boston, and driver picked me up at Logan, brought me right over to WBZ for a talk show, and somebody hands me an AP story and a Drudge headline, you know, that, that says, Zogby says, Election is McCain's to lose. I don't know what Zogby was out there saying that, but it wasn't. And you know, this is whack-a-mole. You know, you, 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 you can't. You can't. You don't even get engaged. You know. That's it. But the good news is, I, I was on the front page of Drudge, you know, a couple of days ago. That's right. That's right. Did you get a little siren? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so let's turn our attention for a little while to this political cycle. And I'd like to start out by asking about a couple of groups that are likely to be very important to the outcome, uh, starting with women, because we're seeing now, uh, in a fair amount of polling, uh, a particularly large gender gap. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that. And this may be your chance to talk about contraception, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for I, this. I can tell. <laughs> Let me sit up. God, what a stupid issue. Uh, honestly, um, you know, I've maintained right along that um, Obama is in a position where he needs to bring home his base because demographically his base favors him in the election. You look at young people, Hispanics, African Americans, and the creative class. But because Obama is the incumbent, there are limits to just how far he can bring his base home. 
that what will put him at the levels of turnout and the levels of support that he received from those groups in 2008 are the Republicans. They will energize the Democratic base. And they did that. It's fear, essentially, is, is, is what it is. Um, that's why, you know, I mean, within hours, you, you, you started to see Ann Romney saying, I want to talk about women and the economy. Of course she wants to talk about women and the economy, because 98%, look, I know I met Villanova, blah, 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 blah. I was raised a Catholic. That's why I got a nervous twitch. Um, <laughs> the joke that bombed at Villanova. Okay. Um, we're, 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 we're good. We're good. <laughs> the, I have no idea what I was going to say. Um, I thought you were talking about uh, changing the subject back to the economy. Yeah. It, the, 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 I mean, the, the fact is 98% of Catholic women who are or have been sexually active, have used birth control. Um, it's, it's a non-issue, and it's also, it also revolves around personal privacy, what is perceived as progress, and also what is perceived as something we don't want to talk about. At the same time, though, during the primaries, we saw that it's an issue that animated a portion of the Republican base. Yeah, it did. And uh, Romney couldn't it, avoid it, talking about it. It angered the portion of the Republican base that have had their boots and galoshes um, by the door saying, is today the day we get to vote against Obama? You know, it didn't bring any new net support over, and it lost support. So given that it animates the base, and alienates women as a group. How then does Romney approach this in the general election? Well, for starters, he tries to avoid it, tries to change the subject, tries to bring women's surrogates out uh, as much as possible. I'm not sure he can succeed in that. I, I, I think that, a but, you know, while the, the Romney path to victory is to bring out as much of an anti-Obama vote as he can. But this is an instance where I think the, um, a constituency was pushed too far. Now, let, let me tell you what I mean by that. Moderate women, um, married women who are traditionally a, a solid Republican and conservative base, that has been cut into. Most importantly, though, one of the fears that the Obama people had was that young women would not come out to vote. This now is a, a rallying cry. And I think, a, a, speaking of, of, of rallying cries and a, at a tough position for Romney to be in, it leads to Latinos. That was actually my next question. Yeah. I was going to ask about the state of play of the Latino vote and how that looks both in terms of the national Latino vote, and how it plays out in the Electoral College? Long answer. Okay, okay. long answer. Um, 1992, Hispanics were 4% of 92 million voters. In 1996, they were 5% of 96 million voters. In 2000, they were 6% of 105 million voters. In 2008, they were 8%, uh, I'm sorry, 2004, uh, they were 8%. Uh, 8 they were 9.2% of 103 million voters in, um, in, in 2008, 133 million voters. And in 2012, we are projecting 11%. That big a jump. That big a jump, the huge jump. Now, that's one piece of it. The market share of the Latino vote rising dramatically. The second piece of that is who gets the market share? Generally speaking, Republicans got to get at least 35% of the market share. I suspect it's got to be a little higher because the vote is so large. How, how, is the polling, how does the polling look now? Uh, right now, um, I have 
and others have, Obama polling in the 60s among Hispanics, he got 69% of the Hispanic vote in 2008. He's gone from the low 40s into the 60s already, but that's only one piece of it. The other piece of it is I haven't seen in any of my polls or anyone else's polls a Republican candidate or Mitt Romney getting higher than 24, 26 percent. Now, that's a huge deficit to, to make up. Um, and the problem is compounded here for Romney because he has gone on record with a very strong anti-illegal immigration stance. Note to Republicans, I polled all during Prop 187 in California. I've polled straight through and I've polled, been polling Latinos now as a separate group unto themselves for 20 years. Anti-illegal to Hispanics means anti-immigration. And anti-immigration means anti-Hispanic. And there's no talking. There's no sitting down and saying, well, you know, no, they, they don't mean that. You know, when they build a fence and deport 12 million people, that's not what they're really talking about, you know. You notice that folks like Rudy Giuliani and George Pataki, Mike Bloomberg, George W. Bush, mm -hmm. it is possible for Republicans to do well. Why? 40% of Hispanic voters are self-described conservatives. Well, that's right, and particularly socially. And particularly socially, and the fastest growing single group among Hispanic voters are uh, born-again evangelical Christians. I've watched them in the last, since 1999 to now, the last 12, 13 years, go from 19% of the Hispanic total to 26% of the Hispanic total. So, but the immigration issue is a deadly issue, just is. Now, one further piece of evidence. In 2010, which was miserable for Obama and for the Democrats, but if you look at Colorado, Bennett, Nevada, Harry Reid, California, Barbara Boxer, you had a higher than average Latino turnout in those three states. And the three Democrats each got over 80% of the Hispanic vote, which means that this is an issue, this is an issue that'll bring them out. So, and Romney, incidentally, can't move to the center on this issue because a lot of people have it here. And, you know, you know, what was that song from the 60s, Sandy something, or there, there is always something there to remind you? Yeah. 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 Trust us, it was, it, it, was, it was a song. <laughs> so, Our parents well, told us about it. I've heard of it. So. Heard, of heard of it somehow, we heard of it. So, so, so then when you model states like Colorado, New Mexico, uh, maybe even Arizona, mm -hmm. what are you seeing in terms of what you expect the numbers to look like in those states this year? Well, let's lump them all with the exception of Colorado. I, I think, Col or, or, I'm sorry, um, Arizona. Arizona. Uh, Arizona is a burgeoning blue state and in fact, I've been suggesting that it's a burgeoning blue state since 2002. Um, uh, with that said, um, there were 12 states that Obama won in 2008 that went heavily Republican in 2010 and have swung all the way back to either an Obama lead or Obama tie. With, with Mitt Romney. And um, those, Obama doesn't need all 12 of those states. Now look, the president can lose. I, you know, don't get me wrong here, but it really is hard for me to see how he loses given 
uh, this this primary season. Well, let, let me let me ask about the economy because I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the economy when we're talking about the election. On the one hand, you have uh, a president who's presiding over an economy that uh, could probably best be described as uh, sluggish or in a very slow recovery. Uh, as we've as we've seen. Uh, the job numbers improve. We've also seen a slight uptick in his overall job approval rating. But I think it's notable that his approval rating overall far outpaces his approval rating on the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, people report the economy to be their number one concern. So you have that complex dynamic on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you have these factors that you were just talking about, the gender gap, uh, the problem that uh, Republicans have with Latino voters, uh, and in particular the difficulty that Romney is going to have as a nominee, uh, distancing himself from his base in a way to appeal to those voters. So that's another complex set of factors on the other hand. So how would you weigh those sets of factors to come to the conclusion, I think you gave us the punchline already, which is that it's hard for you to see how uh, Obama can lose, yet at the same time, uh, we are operating in a larger context where so much attention is given to the economy, and clearly that's weighing him down. Mm -hmm. Bunch of things. Um, first of all, we did a poll a year and a half ago. Unemployment was at 9.8. And we asked voters in increments, um, if unemployment is at 9.8, how likely are you to vote for Barack Obama? very likely, somewhat likely, and so on. We went down in 2% increments. When we got to 8.4%, we saw things even up. When we saw 8.2%, we saw plurality advantage, Obama. Which is, which is where we are now. When we saw 8.0%, 54% said that they would, or were very likely to vote for Obama. So, so there's a tipping point between 8.2 and 8. Yeah, makes it really interesting. Now, in addition, I think, to the number, and there's so many other variables here, but in, in addition to, to that number, there, there is also the, um, the trend line. So I mean, if it went down to 7.8 and was heading back up, you know. But anyway, that, that's one factor. Um, the other factor is there has, there has to be a meaningful Republican alternative on the economy. And in fact, you just saw Mitch Daniels, among others, yesterday saying, um, give us something, Mitt. You know? Now, to be fair, it's April. Anything can happen. Maybe several anythings can happen between now and, and November that, you know, huge global economic crises, there any, any bunch of things can, any one of a bunch of things can trigger it. But there has to be a perceived <coughs> alternative. And one of the things that we know is that um, tax cuts don't cut it. Uh, it's not sufficient. It, it's helpful to middle class uh, Americans, but when you get beyond that, Americans are saying um, majority support infrastructure spending. Majority actually understands that if you raise taxes, that could stimulate the economy. They, they get that. Um, I think there's a couple of conundrums. I, I know I'm coming heavily down on one side. I, I don't usually do that, but that's where I'm at right now. There's a number of conundrums the Republicans face. One, one of them is that they don't answer the revenue side of the budget deficit uh, sufficiently. Um, and when it comes to the stimulus side, I'm not so sure Americans are buying the argument that um, if you cut taxes, you stimulate the economy. There's been a tax cut. Economy is being stimulated, as we were talking about this afternoon. There's only so long I can go with this car. There's only so long I can go with this refrigerator. So there's pent-up demand pressure. There's pent-up demand pressure. And, 
And because of that, there's, the, the, you know, there's, there's a, a rise in consumer uh, confidence. The other problem the Republicans face is the Tea Party. Because you've got basically 70 or so new congressmen that were elected uh, um, identifying with the Tea Party. What do they do? Now listen to this. Do they go back to their districts and say, you sent me to Washington to not compromise. I did not compromise and I got nothing done. Re-elect me. On the flip side is you elected me to go to Washington and not compromise, but I saw that I had a job to do. I did compromise, hence I'm not what you sent to Congress two years ago. Re-elect me. That's a conundrum. Well, what if they go back to the district and say, our values are still under attack. You have to send me back to Washington to protect them. Um, that's a very good point. Um, the problem is, I think public sentiment has shifted. Uh, I don't think, there, there's anger. Uh, there's anger at a lot of the same things, but there is also a sense things are getting a little better. <coughs> At the same time, uh, you know, economy-wise, but at the same time, the budget deficit, which now um, is a as much a Republican responsibility, so then has not been addressed. Okay, so then is the House in play? Actually, you know what it is. I have no idea. Like everybody else, let's just move to the Senate. There were. No doubts that Republicans would regain uh, the Senate. There are lots of doubts now. Same about thing. About six months ago, you were hearing very few doubts. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you I know what's happened is a said, number of those states. Right. You know, are, I think, I think, oh, what we should we should clarify the reason the reason I think the conventional wisdom uh, earlier in the cycle was that the Senate uh, looked very good for Republicans is because of the seats that were uh, that were up. Because remember, the, it's, it's, it's a third of the Senate. Uh, the seats that are up are, uh, first of all, Democrats have to defend far more seats than Republicans this cycle. And the seats that they're defending are seats that they won in a good Democratic year in, uh, in 06. Mm -hmm. So you put those two things together. And it's possible just because of the map that the dynamics in the Senate could be different than the dynamics in the House. Now you're saying, as things now stand, um, the Senate is not a given you know, for Republican control, seven seats. Um, as things now stand in the so, House, so seven, seats. Uh, uh, seven seats swinging mm -hmm. um, uh, from uh, Democrat to Republican for a Republican majority. Um, in the House, um, I don't know, the scuttlebutt. I think, I, I don't, I think it's, is it, I think it's a little less than seven. Six. I think it's, no, I think it would be. F they need three seats. Yeah. Well, if uh, depending on the depending on the White House situation, but still, but it's it's a yeah. small it's a relatively small number. Three seats changing. Yeah, three four maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think four. I think four. Yeah, because it's seven. Um, oh, I see where you get the seven yeah, because yeah. it's 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 a, it's it's the plus and minus. The plus and minus. Right. That's the, right. the, no, that's right. the 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 differential. Right. The differential. I'm just hearing scuttlebutt that the House could be in play. I think it's highly unlikely, but we never know about a wave election. We really don't. I, you know, two clear examples. Um, what, you know, 1948, but more 1980, you know, that race between Carter and Reagan was tied going into Sunday before the election, and then the wave hit. Carter's support was soft, it dropped out. It's, it was support, and then I remember John Anderson was in the race also. That's right. So we have had three consecutive wave elections. Uh -huh. We had uh, 06 and 08 were Democratic waves. Uh, 10 was a Republican wave. If you see a wave building, when do you start to see it in the data? At what point in the cycle would you see it? Well, it all depends, first of all, externally, what's happening. So, you know, in 2008, it was a very competitive race, arguably stayed fairly competitive, but you know, when the bottom fell out of the market, 
Uh, what happened was John McCain, number one, became catatonic, you know, and was then clearly tied with Bush economics. Uh, and, and so in that sense, he never led, except for that one day's sample on Friday. <laughs> but no, but he, he, he never led um, after that. I think it's very facile today, incidentally, to blame Sarah Palin um, for, for his demise. That, that's Monday morning quarterbacking. John McCain, frankly, Sarah Palin did precisely what she was supposed to do. Any good vice presidential nominee is supposed to be good for 72 hours and then disappear. She, she fulfilled half of that. She brought, uh, she, she brought uh, conservatives home. She stole Obama's fresh face and thunder after the huge speech in, in Denver. But then she, you know, she didn't disappear. But clearly, September 17th, 18th, um, when, the, when the market crashed, that was it. Yeah. So that's one aspect of it. You know, we, we just don't know. So you just have to watch the polling as we go through the summer, see if anything develops. Yeah, let's watch. You know, one, there were interesting hints. This is a very interesting business. Don't think of polling as predictive. Think of polling as a snapshot of a moment in time. Or think of it, if I've got to lose 20 pounds by election day, I'm going to get on the scale every day. Now, if by July I've lost 20 pounds, that's great. But I could gain 40 between July and, and election day. It, you know, you've got to watch it. Every, we're just capturing what's going on at that moment in time and analyzing that and not making the predictions. So you shouldn't use April polls to make predictions about no. what's going to happen in November. No. I think that's a good note. Thank you, John. Thank you. And I think it's a good note for us to expand our panel. Yeah, we're going to add uh, two very interesting uh, pundits. And, and, and we'll start with uh, uh, Laura Brown. Uh, Laura's a political science professor at uh, Villanova University. And she also served in the Clinton administration. And then I have a, a dear friend, and everyone knows Vernon Odom. Vernon Odom is the, I, I call you the dean of the, uh, the Philadelphia news, uh, TV news reporters. And uh, I, I don't need to introduce you more. WABC, uh, WABC? Channel 6. Channel 6. Channel PBI, whatever. Channel 6. So, um, um, you, can, you can use the mic over there if you want, Mark. Yeah. I don't have to sit down. Yeah. 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 Just wing it there, Matt. Just wing. The interesting thing I find in this 2012 election, I think this battle actually started uh, January 21st in, uh, in 2009 because immediately Obama embarked upon a number of things that he knew would be controversial, trying to get through the health care plan. The economy was continuing to tumble and things like that. And the Republican opposition, <clears throat> they'd already staked out their ground. They were pretty much going to try to obstruct anything that he tried to do, any initiative from that point on. It's uh, within a couple of months, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell says, our main priority here is to try to prevent Obama from having a second term. Um, the Tea Party was emerging as a stronger and stronger element. They were getting a lot of time on, uh, on cable TV especially. And the impact of cable TV can never be underestimated during this time because you've got such polarized TV channels, MSNBC, uh, Fox News, and the CNN somewhere drifting in the middle back and forth depending on the situation and the ratings that month, that shoot period move around there. And uh, you had this breaking out, you had this dynamic. And of course, the African-American community, there was an enormous amount of emotional uh, and, and symbolic investment in Barack Obama's presidency based on history, which I don't have to go into here. But you, you've, watched, you've watched that play out in a very, very uh, interesting way. Because while there has not been a whole, whole lot 
of reaction from the black community. There's been a silent minority out there that's been infuriated by a lot of the Republicans' tactics. Uh, Sorry with the Tea Party and pictures of Obama in uh, a witch doctor outfit from Africa and all the other things that have been played out. The uh, assaults aimed at the First Lady and things like that. So what I've, what I've noticed in the last year or so, I, I, I mentioned it to Matt one time, I was at a rally. Obama came to give a public, or a very boring policy speech out one of the Philadelphia suburbs about six months ago. And he got up and gave a speech. I looked out at the crowd out there. There was a small crowd gathered. It was right during the middle of the week. And uh, there was a small crowd out there. It said, they had signs up there, Barack, we have your back. They weren't making much noise about it. It was a very symbolic, interesting uh, statement. I went over talking to people, and they said they were angry about the way he'd been treated. And I, I, as I've watched this thing play out, I often wonder is, and I look, always look at, sometimes when they say when a new nation is, is, is forming, it's the first election that's important when they exercise the democracy. But sometimes I, I believe that it's the second election that is the most important under this new, unprecedented situation because that's either to ratify that things have really changed or that there's going to be a reaction to take things back to the way they were. And I think that's an interesting dynamic to watch here because as I look at the demographics of this, as, as the country gets blacker and browner during this period of time, you wonder is the Tea Party reaction if you remember, people were screaming at first, we want our country back. We want to wear this. Don't you put your miserable government hands on my Medicare. You remember some of the just uh, <laughs> incredible statements that were being made out there. And uh, you look at that, and I wonder, is this, has the country really changed, or will it go back to what, it, what we were before? And, that, and, I, and I'll expand on that, but I don't want to talk too long. But those are some of the things I look at, and some of the tactics that have gone on you look at the Republicans trying to fish around for a candidate and a sound philosophy. You've had what's been called a clown car. People pulling up. Donald Trump was a front runner. Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, Herman Cain. I went to college with Herman Cain. He was an upperclassman, incidentally, and uh, he was always a pretty good food salesman. But, he, uh, but you look at people who they've actually put up their front runner. It's almost shameful. And then Newt Gingrich, he was recycled and. Uh, then uh, Rick Santorum, who I knew once he got to a national level and people started taking a long look at him, it was going to be like, to many people, sort of like Jack Nicholson's Joker in that original Batman movie. He was going to say, wait till they get a load of me. Well, he, and that's exactly, if you see, that's exactly the way it played out. So I found some very interesting things here, and I found a lot of showbiz and a lot of things in which to laugh, but there's some deep-seated things there that deeply concern me and deeply have worried me as I've watched this situation play out and all the potential racial polarization. I, for one, never bought the notion that, that there was a post-racial America coming out of the 2008 election. That was all bull. If I had a newspaper writer uh, who, who wrote that, who was supposed to be a thinker and put, put thought pieces in it, I, I, would fi I would fire them because I knew it was not going to work then. I knew it was, there was going to be this there's going to be this backlash. As a, as a child who grew up in the Deep South in the 60s, and uh, my father was, and mother were both activists, and I started covering the news in Georgia in 1968. And I break in basically around Martin Luther King's assassination as a reporter and radio in Atlanta while in college. I knew there'd be this Southern backlash. I knew there'd be this backlash even to Obama's election as President of the United States. And it has played out. One more quick note. There's a very good friend of mine, he's a former Newsweek correspondent, he's retired now and an author. But we sat there the night Obama was elected, and we said, you know, Smitty, I said, has the game passed us by? We were in grad school at Columbia together. We, we, we've been friends since that long. I said, has life passed us by? Are we, is this, has America really changed so drastically from what we remember? And, and he said, maybe so, maybe so. And then you saw the backlash developing. Much of it philosophical, based on maybe fiscal issues or other matters. But I, I submit that there's a, there's a there's octane pushed into the jet fuel there by race as the underlying issue. And so I'll stop stop with that and pass it along. So I don't want to make too much time. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you both for being here, and thank you, Matt, for uh, doing Appreciate this. This has really, I think, been informative and helpful. I, I'll tell you that when I look at the election, um, I pretty much see the mirror image of 2004. 
I think um, one of the things when you start to look at partisan identification and partisan support of the incumbent president, um, if you looked at George W. Bush in 2004, he was essentially carrying Republicans well, um, splitting independents, and he had lost Democrats really significantly. Um, in fact, he pretty much lost Democrats after he went into Iraq. And I think one of the things that you see essentially with President Obama is that the Democrats are hugely behind him. He's sort of splitting the independents, and the Republicans are largely against him. So I think this is why, when I look at the election, one of the things that I see is that I think this is going to be a largely negative election. I think it's going to be largely pretty close and very competitive. Um, even though I absolutely agree that many of these states demographically should be in Obama's camp. So that sounds great. But here's the problem. In the 2008 election, in fact, um, President Obama carried 51% of married women. Um, and again, when you look at single women, in that poll that was recently done by CBS and New York Times, uh, single women were in favor of um, President Obama by 62%, yet in the 2008 elector oh, exodus, he carried single women by 69%. You see this among Hispanics, you also see this among young people. In other words, um, Obama not only needs some of the same turnout, but because he's actually carrying fewer percentages, it's likely going to be a closer race. And so, as I said, when I look at this, to me, I see very much kind of a mirror image of 2004. But there's kind of one twist on it, which is a little bit bizarre to me. Since 1968, when incumbents have run for re-election, um, pretty much what you see is that Four of them won, and they won much larger than they won their first election. So Nixon in 72, Reagan in 84, Clinton in 96, Bush in 2004. And if you didn't win, and win big, you lost. So Ford lost, Carter lost, Bush Sr. lost. This would actually be really historic from sort of an incumbent re-election understanding to actually see an incumbent um, win, but win by less than what he won the first time. And I think that is so indicative of the economy, of the circumstances that this president is facing. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me when I look at some of this polling data is that President Obama actually had higher support among Republicans on the day of his inaugural than George W. Bush had among Democrats on the day of his inaugural. So when we talk about sort of what's going on, I think we can't forget how phenomenally polarized the electorate is and how much you view the incumbent and you view a politician through the lens of your political party and your partisan identification. And that at the end of the day, um, part of the problem with sort of understanding how these elections are going to turn out is we've actually seen increasing polarization over time. Um, Barack Obama has uh, more polarized like support numbers than any president since Gallup has basically been looking at this. That's really phenomenal. Um, and I, again, I agree, some of it's philosophical, some of it is certainly, I think it would be difficult to say not attributed to race, um, even though it's tough to sort some of those things out. I also think, as I said, this ends up being a much closer election than I think either side is looking forward to. And I think it's part of the reason why I think it's going to be pretty ugly. Um, because there's going to be a lot of anti-votes rather than pro-votes. Okay. Um, why, why don't we uh, give everybody the opportunity to ask questions? We have about 20 minutes if you have any questions you'd like to ask us. Um, do you want me to touch it? Uh, do you want to reach? Let me get one. Great. So, my question was about Latino voters. Um, there's been a lot of talk on the news about Marco Rubio potentially being the vice presidential nominee. Do you think there's any truth to the talk that he would supposedly deliver Latino voters? Um, 
Uh, me? Uh, yeah. I'll start. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that problem number one is part of the uh, essential part of the Republican strategy is to run against someone young and experienced who had never run anything before. So th that negates Marco Rubio. Um, uh, I suspect that that's going to climb up to 70. Uh, slower than normal. It's slower than normal, normal, but it always gets it, it, Because fundamentally, uh, Israel is not the most important voting issue. Uh, liberal uh, stances and positions are. Um, Muslims will break 10 to 1, you know, for Obama, but an issue is going to be turned out. There's a, that is a group where there's a lot of disappointment. Um, Mormons, um, it's not so much who Mormons are going to vote for. You're not going to see Mormons for Obama. <laughs> there's, a, there's a prediction. Um, but, um, what, 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 what about the presence, right, uh, the, the presence of a Mormon candidate in See, this is, another, this is another issue because when you look at, aside from liberal Democrats, um, the, the one group that says 31% of self-described social evangelical conservatives, 31% have said they will never vote for a Mormon. Now, do I believe that? No, but it's out there. It's, it's a problem for Mitt Romney. Let me just say, I think one of the more interesting things is going to be to see the Western state, because you're going to have high percentage of Mormon turnout yep. and high percentage of Hispanic turnout. So we're going to see sort of in those western states, um, places like Nevada, places like Arizona, places like New Mexico, um, how that actually plays in the electorate. John, Pat Cannell and Dr. Schultz are working on this third party. Yes. Getting states registered. Have you sensed any, if they're getting any momentum or which way they're going? Not yet. It's, it's being crowded out by the hyper-partisanship. You know, first of all, the, the Republican primaries, and then secondly, you know, um, you know, Romney versus Obama, cable news. You know, the centrists do not have their own cable channel, or, nor do they have a passionate blog. There, there are sufficient numbers, but what there is isn't yet is intensity. And so Americans elect and, you know, initiatives like that. I suppose there's always a third party, maybe even a second party, that is centrist and waiting to be formed. But there isn't that critical mass, high intensity level just yet. I suspect they would only have an effect if they were to nominate a celebrity candidate who would naturally get a lot of media play. Uh, or possibly Ron Paul, although I don't think that he would do it. Can I ask a second question? How much more expensive is it to go from voter, registered voter, and likely voter in doing those polls? How much more does it cost? Because I think that makes a big difference. It's a huge difference. In the poll. Yeah, one of the factors I didn't mention in the nine-point lead was that it was published as all adults. And that's problematic. Uh, it's not much more expensive. In fact, what makes polls more expensive, you know, just these national surveys like that, is whether you use random digit dialing or not. I don't use random digit dialing. Random digit dialing is where you're just um, stratifying the, the, the um, uh, area codes, three-digit exchanges, and then um, calling a lot of useless scrambled numbers. That is much more expensive. Um, but, you know, filtering down, no, it's, you know, you're talking about a couple of dollars per interview. That's all. John, maybe you could talk a little bit about how those samples look different, typically, when you do poll. Like yeah, I, I, that's a very good, very good point. Um, 
if, if you're polling politics and policy, I think you use a likely uh, voter model. Because ultimately, that's all that counts, that's all that influences, and that's all that votes. Now, if you, there are some who would suggest, well, uh, all adults will have an impact, um, you know, especially if it's on various government policies that impact all people. But the bottom line is, the reason I'm I, I don't trust uh, election polls that have all adults is that it's a misrepresentation of the electorate, number one. Number two is that you start with all adults in February, March, April, May, and then you segue over into registered voters and then segue over into likely voters in September and October, and then you say, oh, the president's up, the president's down, Romney's up, Rom you're comparing apples and oranges. That's one thing to look at. Another thing to look at is don't say Pew has Obama up by five this week, but Gallup has Romney up by four next week. Do the Pew trend line, the Zogby trend line, the Gallup trend line. Don't mix samples. That's right. That's right. Do you know average them out, though? Averaging them out is good, um, but it's a whole lot better when you get closer to the election, because watch the real clear politics average. They'll average in something over a month time. And in this, you know, that's obsolete. As you get closer to the election also, these surveys should converge to some extent. Uh, there are house effects. So if you were to look mm. at, uh, if you were to look over time, as John said, is absolutely right. You look over time within the same polling organization, it gives you a sense of the direction. And especially this far out, that's really more useful than looking at the actual number. Do we have any other questions? In that case, um, Marwan, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.